exploring the natural world one podcast episode at a time. This is For What It's Earth. Hi all and thank you for joining me for another episode of For What It's Earth by me, Marissa Jacobs of the Art of Ecology. And here we are talking about with Sam Rebecca and I, some permanent guest, that we're going over climate change from sky to core. And last week we talked all about soil health, a little bit of plate tectonics, things that are getting impacted by climate change, such as the permafrost layer and desertification that are happening. But ultimately, we both are really passionate about the fact that, yeah, this is this is uh, kind of scary, can be really heavy, but we should not be living in fear because of it. And so... Each episode, I really wanted us to kind of talk about maybe some of the good things that are still happening or ways to still be providing hope. But with this last mini series finale, I really wanted us to go a little more in depth with where directly our hope as scientists and as just general people that live on this planet, where that comes from and maybe some outside of the box thinking so that we're not as climate anxiety induced as we possibly could be. So Sam, your thoughts on where, where your hope as a climate science, not, not a climate scientist, but as a scientist, science lover, earth enthusiast and just general person who lives? Where's my hope? Um, I think my initial hope is just in the understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I I think there's just so much uh, misinformation provided um, and the, the idea of trusting, I know we've talked about this, but trusting our scientists and- um, Yeah our educators and what they're telling us. I, I think that's where a lot of it stems from um, is that understanding. And I just, I hope that people can start to learn um, just even just that, that high level about it. Not, um, and, and start to be able to make the connections that we can then to why they should care. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, good note to to say, hey, we should trust our scientists. Um, but I think adding a healthy dose of questioning the science, but not in terms of being argumentative or yes. defensive, but uh, curious, I think will really help. Yes, I totally agree. Um, Asking and asking questions should not be seen as something bad. And I think it often is. Um, If you ask questions, it means that you don't believe something or um, you're thinking negatively about it. And that is, that's not, that's what science was based on. Asking questions. Yes, absolutely. I I don't, I don't know how true this is, but I know a lot of times when I teach and I, I teach with a methodology called inquiry-based education, which is the like ultimate Slytherin form of teaching where I get kids and adults, whoever, to build their own connections by answering their questions with further questions that kind of direct them down the path I want them to go. But uh, so that's how Slytherin, it's a little, a little maniacal. Um, But by, instead of them being like, oh, what's this mushroom? And me just saying, that's a poofball mushroom. There's really no connection that they made to it. And it's going to be really easy for them to forget. But if I'm like, okay, well, let's look at the shape. What color is it? What do the gills look like? Here's a field guide. 
how can we go through and use this dichotomous key to figure out what mushroom this is? And at first, a lot of kids who have not had me as a teacher get really like, whoa, um, I just wanted to know the mushroom. But then they, they start to realize like, oh, they're forming their own connections in their brain. And the next day, the day after, weeks, months later, they're able to recall that information because now they, they truly know it. Right. And I don't see very much of that in just the world in general of saying, let's ask questions, not because, like you said, we're trying to not believe something, but because we're trying to form new connections and gain this deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. So I think (laughs) it's interesting that that's how you like to teach, because that's literally what we just did doing this series. You mentioned it, like we would look things up in the middle of talking because we have questions. Right. And, and instead of just saying, Oh, well, I don't know. And that that I'm just going to leave it as, I don't know it lead, you know, we are inquisitive enough to want to learn more, which I'm sure if we kept looking would dig us to more questions. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. Which is kind of a cool thing about science is one discovery leads to 8 million questions about the one answer you just received. And then it it spurs that. And I also, it just wouldn't make for a good podcast. If you were like, "Hmm, what does permafrost? What what is that? What's up with that? And you just looked at me and you're like, I don't know. And we moved on and we're like, okay, (laughs) that's not good. (laughs) It's not good in general. Um, But yeah, I think that education is really important. Mm -hmm. And also teaching about it in a way that is not fear inducing. I think that's a fine, a fine toe, uh, a fine line to tread there, which can be hard. Yeah, because there has to be something to spark enough interest. And unfortunately, it seems in the human world, um, fear is one of those, um, not just general either knowledge or bettering of yourself. Um, so I feel like not that I, I, I don't like inducing fear of, of why something should be important, right. But to hit that human brain of, Hmm, I feel like there needs to be enough of it. Because if you just say, oh, this is why you should care, people right. don't care unless you say something like, well, your house is going to fall into the Atlantic Ocean. Right. That will make people listen to you. That will definitely make people listen to you. That's a little dramatic, but it's true. Um, I think just you you saying like that little dose of fear. Well, let's think of how media operates or even if we don't want to think media because media is is scary or whatever how about everybody's like favorite fantasy series or any non-fiction not not false no we want fiction not non-fiction but everything you have to have a conflict to make a good story right. so if we're trying to be Obviously, we're not storytellers here in the sense that we're making this info up, but storytellers in the sense that we are conveying a message in a way that attracts people to want to listen and hear the resolution of that story. You need a little bit of conflict to be like, oh, well, what happens next? Well, what happens next is you save the freaking planet is what happens next. I think the word conflict is a much better way of putting it than fear because it just, because conflict doesn't necessarily have to be scary or um, painful. You know, it's, it's just, it's conflict is okay to have. Yeah. Fear is not necessarily okay. Right. I, I also think enough, it, Again, going back to the first episode, it really is all about wording and Mm -hmm. conflict versus fear. 
but also respect versus fear. Oh yeah. Um, my husband used to hate heights, was scared of heights. And then he became an arborist, which climbs trees, really tall trees with a chainsaw. And sometimes you go upside down with the chainsaw. So it was I still like, can't believe that. Right. <laughs> right. And now he's, he's fine. Um, but at first he would say things like, I, it is scary to be up that high. And then we started looking at as a wet, looking at just the whole situation of, okay, respect your situation. Do not be afraid of it and understand the implications of if you do something incorrectly in terms of using the chainsaw, in terms of how you move along a tree branch, things like that, there could be some negative implications. However, it's also a really cool career and you're helping the tree to survive even better. So it's good as well as then understanding what the body does when we are afraid and we tense up, we get really nervous, our muscles contract sort of thing. And that can also have really bad implications right. on using a chainsaw upside down in a tree properly. So it's like, I don't want you to be scared, but I want you to respect the situation. And I think that's another thing of like, okay, we don't need to be scared of climate change, but we need to respect its power. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. But I don't know if that that's is just my, again, I'm a Slytherin. So if that's just my way of thinking and viewing that, or if uh, that actually makes sense to people. No, like that makes so much sense. And that is not, that is not how my brain works. Um, and I probably, because while yes, I do have fears, I feel like when when I'm doing things that normal people would be afraid of, like hiking, um, I can remember we were in Tennessee hiking the Smoky Mountains and um, I slipped and literally almost fell off of a major cliff. Um, well, fun. Yeah. Wow. It was, <laughs> and I can still think back to that. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> like it didn't yeah. it didn't have that fear that I probably should have. Um, but when I think about when I saw the fear in my husband's eyes and he, yeah. I was like, oh, that was kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I have fears of, uh, <laughs> and then I have a fear of growing up. I was afraid of black bears, which is ridiculous yeah. because I shouldn't at all be afraid of them. But I had this irrational fear of the, mm -hmm. the black bear sitting in my parking spot when I would get home late at night and that it wouldn't move. And that I have to circle the block over and over and that the bear was just going to sit there and I couldn't get out of the car because it was a bear and I was afraid of it. So, so I wonder, does this lead, this leads me to think of, are there actual, cause the term, like the idea of irrational fears is while they seem irrational, they're still, you know, they're still your fear. Are there people right. that have kind of these irrational fears of climate change different than the people that are afraid of it because the media or whoever is telling right. us to be afraid of it. Um, hmm. I, I do know of a lot of stories and articles that are put out, especially in the education world to science educators or um, high school educators a lot recently. And I, I don't truly know how irrational they are as much as dramatic and extreme. Mm. So if we split them up there, because I, I understand the rationality behind it, but I do think it's over the top and does not need to be. Whereas like, yeah, it makes sense that humans are biologically scared of venomous snakes. I understand the rationality behind that. Now, someone who goes and then chops off all the heads of venomous snakes for no good reason, that, that's not okay. So we can take that fear to another extreme. And again, the fear versus respect. I respect that that venomous snake could mess me up. <laughs> all right. Um, but climate anxiety is really, really huge in people that are a couple years younger than us. So we are both millennials and it really started being 
a more understood phenomenon with Gen Z. And there was a high rate of, or an unusually high rate of teen suicides that happened. And a lot of it seemed to stem from climate anxiety Hmm. and the fact that a lot of kids were like, well, I'm not going to live long enough to contribute to this society to be of any value because the planet is going to die before I ever reach an age where I can contribute. And it added this feeling of worthlessness and undervaluing oneself and created a lot of depression and anxieties. And so a lot of kids were like, I might as well not be here. And reading those articles is kind of what then spurred me to be like, this is insane that there are kids who are like, the planet's going to die and therefore I don't have value because I'm never going to live wow. long enough to see myself be of any value. Um, and I thought that was really sad. <laughs> yeah. I have not heard that at all. That's yeah. horribly depressing. Yeah. To think of. And so then that leads me to think, obviously there is not enough push out there for these kids to think that we can make it better. And that, that we can make it better or I don't help. need to be a certain age to have value. Yes. Uh, those were the two things that like, I really want to show that we're going to see painted buntings. We're going to start to understand how new seeds are growing up through the seed bank. Like there's some really amazing stuff happening and there are ways for us to mitigate it. There are new technologies. There are some really great things out there as well as then empowering youth to say, you want to go plant a tree? You can be a preschooler and help me plant a tree. Like, yeah, everyone has value. Yep. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Now I don't know. That was uh, maybe, oh geez. When would I (sighs) mid 2000 teens. So probably 2016 to 2018 is when I was really seeing these articles being pushed in the education community. Hmm. That's now been a couple of years. I don't know how that has changed, especially with child advocates like Greta Thunberg, things like that of now there are these kids that are like, I'm seeing other kids that are making a difference. I can too. So I don't know how stuff has changed, but that was definitely like um, a light bulb moment right. as well as like an explosion in my brain of like, this is, this is happening. Okay. Yeah. We need to do something. Thinking of climate or um, child activists, um, it's, it's happening outside of even the climate world, which is unfortunate that it has to happen in the situation I'm thinking of, but um, it, it brings to light um, the power of kids and their brains. Yeah. So after the Parkland shooting, there was a major push by those, um, by the students for, um, students against violence. So, um, when they were, I remember they had planned a huge March in DC and this was, uh, bef- this was probably 2019, I believe is when this happened. And so my parents and I had already had a trip planned. They were coming to visit. We were going to go to DC. And then I was like, all right, there's this March happening. Um, We'll just be aware of it happening. And so we, we were walking around, we were downtown. And so we heard, we heard it, we we heard the announcements. And so my mom and I were like, we want to see what this is. And if you've ever seen Um, any images out of DC where they hold like the parades and a lot of the marches it's on this majorly wide street and my mom and I walk right from the mall half a block down and it's just this street is full of people 
and it's these kids on this stage talking about violence. And I just remember thinking, this is incredible. These kids pulled this whole march together. Um, they are the ones that, you know, worked with the, um, the group hosting it and setting things up and getting presenters. And I just remember thinking, this is awesome. This is awesome that these kids have done this and people are listening to kids as they're talking. And so I hope that in, you know, the wake of horrible situations that our kids have to deal with, they are learning to find their voice yeah, and, and how to do something about it. And I, yeah. I hope that that shows up in other parts of their life as well. Yeah, it doesn't need to be just a, a climate a perspective as much as just a advocacy for oneself. Um, right. It, you know, and that, that's kind of where I was with that. Um, yeah. They cared enough and they care enough, not just about themselves and their school, but other kids, because they were able to say, I've had this, this situation happen to me. I don't want it to happen to other kids right. or other kids that have here's how they can deal with it. Yeah. And that's a major way of thinking and being able to, to support others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, your talk about the, the kids that were organizing that grand scale in DC, um, Bucks County, which is where I had lived for a couple of years outside of college, they, uh, there was a group called Beescape, which was BS. So Bucks Students for Climate, BSC Advocacy, and uh, it was Beescape. I'm going to, I'm going to look this up so that I know, <laughs> but they were this group, this group of Bucks County students who was very involved in environmental advocacy, as well as like environmental and social justices. So it was Bucks students for climate action and protection of the environment, pro people, pro planet. So it was really cool. And these were like high school students who were that passionate about the environment as well as the implications that it has on human. It was really cool to see. Yeah, that's awesome. So I that's definitely kind of know. So cool. Yeah. Yes, it is really cool to see. Um, and then to be like, okay, so there's that generation now who uh, they're growing up and they're they're saying they're making a difference where they are, when they are as well as then that's going to impact career pathways. And I'm really excited to see how their brains work and what they develop and think yeah. of and new ideas and concepts for sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. There's, I think back even to the difference between um, what kids have now compared to what we had at their age in terms of technology and yeah. access to information and some of the things that kids and young, even young adults at this point, I realize I am almost 30. Yeah, <laughs> I am right. not a young adult with a, you know, in college. Um, but the things that they think of, I think back to when I was that age and I feel like I never could have thought of some of these things. Right. No, I totally get it. I awesome. uh, was, my mom tried to, since we just moved, she found this like young adults group that she emailed and I was like, mom, do you see the age range for that? I don't fit in that anymore. And she was like, oh my gosh, my daughter's not a young adult anymore. And I was like, yeah, well, uh, it happens. But yeah, looking at these discoveries, I, you know, I, I keep thinking of all like little kid stuff in comparison to being like, oh, I was still eating worms at that point in life. And I was like, no, even as a young adult, I probably was still like, I like color and, you know, playing with dirt. And over here, there's all these engineers doing crazy mathematical equations, solving real world problems. And I'm, I like color. Yeah. Um, my niece in kindergarten, she's now in, um, oh my, she's now in fourth grade. But when she was in kindergarten, her favorite part of school I remember asking her at one point 
she said was coding. I was like, Co- code, like coding is in computer code. Well, I was like, what does she mean? <laughs> um, yes, they had stem, STEM time yeah. in kindergarten, and they were all. This is was at the time when like these quote coding toys were really popular, and so it was the concept of kids learning um, like directional movements and how plugging in a certain combination of buttons makes something do something else. So she had this little caterpillar that had different directions on it. Yeah. And depending on how you put them together would, you know, kind of organize how it would move. And they had all these STEM toys in her kindergarten class. Did we have those? Uh, Because I don't think we had those. No. You know what we did? I had half day kindergarten and I took a nap during half day kindergarten. (laughs) I remember painting a lot because we had like free, like uh, free explorative time, which is a really good thing for kindergartners to have. Um, And I did a lot of art, which makes sense. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't remember there being other my niece was options by the time she was done with kindergarten. Like she's awesome. Good for her. My nephew too. And who he is younger. So yeah, it, it's incredible. What even what is being taught at their age. Yeah. And, and it's being made fun for them. And it's a part of like their normal lives to have these right. kind of toys and activities that they're, they're able to think this way. I just think it's incredible. So cool. I, mean, I didn't use computers in school. I think until like, other than a little bit in elementary it's school, like, great, like yeah. I remember the computer lab. Oh, that was like big deal. Right. Fifth, it was a huge deal to go to the grade, computer lab. I think was the first time that I can remember being like, we, guess what guys, for this paper, you need a computer resource, not just a library book resource. Yep. You guys get to use the computer and we would go on and be like, what is Google? Woo! Folks at that time, it was like, ask Jeeves and Oh Yahoo. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Ask a Jeeves. Jeeves was a butler and you could actually ask him things. He was like Siri before Siri ever was born. Um, I'm pretty sure Jeeves is Siri's like great grandfather or something. But either way, yeah, Club Penguin. Oh, yeah. Um, Eopets, you know, the early, I guess that wasn't even early internet. That was mid early internet. Yeah. But like still, yeah. now there's these kids who have had this all of their lives and now what a lot of parents I hear are concerned about that and I'm like but I didn't have cool stem toys I didn't have opportunities to learn how to code which might have made an impact on my lack of mathematical brain like I right I just see a lot of beautiful places for kids to learn Definitely technology for it just needs to be, you know, handled properly. Yes. The internet in general. I mean, even thinking of older generations, so completely flipping the coin, overusing the internet and trusting everything on the internet. Yes. There's a whole published. Exactly. It's on the internet. It has to be real. Yeah. Very true. Um, Very true. Which then takes a level of critical thinking and uh, discernment that I think uh, the younger generation who has had computers for their whole life uh, have a new level of that right. that was not needed previously. Yep. Or right. not so valued gonna, in the same degree. Right. So then that's going to lead them, I suspect, to incredible opportunities and and things that they're going to create. Yeah, which, yeah, definitely. I know we were talking about wildlife corridors before and just the engineering 
ingenuity that that sort of object or thinking takes. Um, but there are some really incredible conservation success stories um, that that I hear. And there's only going to be more because now there's more people mm-hmm. out there who are caring about it and thinking about our planet in a way of, I need to be a steward of it. Exactly. So yep. definitely. And um, if we can respect climate change and understand that there are some bad things that could happen, there are still some really beautiful things that could as well. And we can respect it and say, I acknowledge you. You are real, you are happening. And I'm excited to see where this goes. Yeah, and that that's a way, I need to flip my brain on that um, to try to find the positive things in, at that coming that are coming yeah. out of climate change. Um, I need to be more mindful to look for those than just all yeah. the things that are going bad. Right, and I, I think, again, that is a lot of, media and educations, I don't want to say fault because I don't want to place blame here, but that is for lack of a better term. Um, that's where a lot of the focus lies in education mm-hmm. and in what we read online uh, and see on the news is a lot of these bad things because again people like that conflict they want to they want to see it they want to read more about it um right but it shouldn't be something that you have to look for it should be brought to you and told to you like um it shouldn't just be oh here's all the bad stuff it should be both sides of the coins of here is the bad and the good combined so that you Mm -hmm. can make um, appropriate decisions about how you need to be operating. Yeah. Yeah. And this is probably where we came in pretty well because you were always more of the, um, happy focus, which yeah. is interesting as a Slytherin, but you were right. always like that. Yeah. And I feel like I, I was, yeah, yeah it's a bit more negative. I think that that's one of the things I've actually had a lot of conversations with people being like, Uh, When toxic positivity, a more known term, I was like, wait, is that me? Because I really, I do just want people to be happy. But then I had to discern what toxic positivity truly meant. And then I'm like, oh, no, I'm fully aware that there there are things that suck for sure. Um, I just know that I am the one in control of my emotions. And... Yes, I am. I am. My brain is saying, hey, this thing is bad. And I can say, hmm, the thing is bad. And here's how I will operate because of that. And it is not out of anger. It's not out of fear. But it is out of hope and cheerfulness. Um, And I have to work at it sometimes. (laughs) Definitely. You've always been good at it, though. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I I feel as if as I am growing up and adulting more and more, there are more and more uh, obstacles that I have to be like, okay, we're going to work at this. We're going to, it's okay. We can do this. Um, So, and that's, it's interesting. We're talking about how kids are so, are are starting to become more focused on being aware of, uh, you know, climate change, but you're right. As you become an adult, I mean, kids have a lot of stressors on them. I right. get it. Especially now. So different. I would not want to be a kid right now. During this, to oh be gosh. honest. I know. All, all I the know. technical advances are awesome. But to be honest, I want to be left to my bike outside because there's so many other stressors that kids deal with. Yeah. But then I think I look at like my adult life and not even stressors in the fact that like, oh, I have all these things to take care of. It's just your brain works in a different way and you start to think of things differently. And I feel like, um, you need to, or you feel like you need to push some things away. And this is where you have to be more actively engaged in things that you are interested in or 
in, you know, climate activism. It may come more naturally to kids just because they're just like, kids are just kind of like, I'm going to go do this thing. Like this thing interests me. I'm they don't have do filters this. yet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I feel like another thing is I often think of like the kid generation to young adult, the older generation, but like anything in between, I'm just kind of like, eh, I don't think about these people <laughs> because I don't know. No, I They're just adults. They have it all together. Uh, yeah. Well, I always um, put my parents on a pedestal. I have wonderful, wonderful parents, but the way that I was raised, I, I guess was so wholesome. <laughs> oh, poor me. But, um, I, ne- I, my view of adults was they have it all together. They have no problems whatsoever. When really my parents had a lot of concerns and stressors. I grew up in a low income family and I didn't know it growing up. Um, Mm -hmm. and now that I am no, apparently no longer a young adult, um, (laughs) my parents are letting me in on little things from my childhood where I'm like, I'm sorry, what was happening behind the scenes (laughs) of, um, just understanding more financial stuff, understanding, um, why my parents moved to the Poconos in the first place and um, conflict, resolution issues, things like that, just life in general and learning that like my parents are people too. And I am not just a failure of a human sort of thing of, well, why am I having all these things when I saw what these adults were like? (laughs) And so I think it's really important as we, as you and I become adults (laughs) or are apparently, who knows, um, to show the next generation that, uh, how you said conflict's not necessarily a bad thing, but how there can be these things in the world, like climate change or general life stuff that go wrong, but ultimately we can make informed decisions about those things. I think it's important to set that example. Yes, I agree. Um, But I can imagine that's a really hard thing to do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a pretty loaded uh, concept. Yeah, we got real, real heavy here with this last one. (laughs) (laughs) No, definitely. Um, I know personally, I get a lot of kind of the basis for my hope from the fact that I am a Christian. So I have this um, viewpoint or perspective on what uh, the Bible says about promises that God has made us. And I know that not everybody shares my belief system or views, and that's totally fine. I did just want to make a mention that I, I do know for me and for many others as well, that having a, like a spiritual connection can really be a grounding sort of tool right. or um, utilization here. And mm-hmm. so I, as a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, um, which, which all also is very loaded in the scientific community, how I see... <laughs> God's hand in the scientific field. Yep. And um, so I, I know many conservative Christians would not agree with many of the things that I probably do. Um, however, there are portions of the Bible that talk about God's promises. And one of the promises, which you can look at it in a negative way, is that the earth will not be here always. But what happens is so beautiful. And that God says, here's this imperfect thing, this fallen thing, and I will restore it. And as I continue in my scientific endeavors, um, I see 
that restoration coming. And I'm very excited for that, which gives me a lot of hope then. Um, as well as then, so that's like the base of my hope, but then even further, I see the conservation success stories. I see these more, I guess you could say tangible, uh, mm -hmm. tangible evidence that there are people out here making a real difference in the planet. There are these conservation success stories. There are cool seed bank stuff, cool, cool bits that are still happening. And it is very inspiring. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, but, yeah, I mean, this is definitely a topic we've talked about mm -hmm. through our years of science growth yeah. um, in high school and through college. And so I know we've talked a lot about that, but even other religions outside of Christianity have mm -hmm. a very close tie to the earth and to yeah. nature. And so I think that's really interesting because even if we don't have the same basis of faith um, or spiritual, mm -hmm. your spirituality, however it is, I feel like there's this common connection of the earth. Yeah, in absolutely. all of those. And so I think that that really shows the importance of it. Yeah, that so many people can all come together and say that this has meaning, this has um, beauty, this has a, a reason for us to protect it beyond physical or mental. And now we've got this like spiritual realm right. involved. I don't really want to say realm. Realm sounds like we're going to other planes of reality, but this spiritual aspect to it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I know that that can definitely be of help. My husband's reading the Tao Te Ching right now. And uh, that's been interesting. And it is very, um, even in, in Taoism, you can still see the uh, connection. There's a lot of metaphors made to rivers and paths and things like that and mm -hmm. permeates everything even when you think of think of like fantasy worlds think of um lord of the rings and yeah. game of thrones and all these other fantasy worlds there are still ties to like the nature aspect mm -hmm. of their earth yeah and I just think that's incredible that that, I mean, I understand that is what we see and what we live in, but, um, that, that can be, we a revere it so much. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so yeah. why wouldn't we want to save it is the one thing there is like a disconnect for me sometimes because it's held on such a pedestal, but yet some people, it seems like are just like, well, I'll let whatever happens, happens instead of trying to right. protect what we have. Right. right. I think sometimes, and this is truly just my own perceptions. This might not be true at all. Uh, but I, I do think that sometimes people think that the actions are above, like so far mm -hmm. above what they can do. You're right. And we all hear about the single use plastics and what we can do for that. And that's easy personal action. But we hear a lot of like, well, there are these big corporations that are exuding the carbon emissions and stuff like that. And that is way out of what an individual can do. Or we talk about the permafrost layer and joke that I'm going to throw ice cubes in the tundra and hope that helps. And know that that's a joke. I can't fix that by myself. Um, so, so I, I definitely can see how people would think I can't do anything. So why should I bother? Why should I waste that energy and that time and try to view positively when there isn't anything to view positively? Um, but I, I think we also forget that there's strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. And we are a planet of 7 billion and growing. And when we all participate in something, how powerful we can be. So true. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Do you have any other thoughts to share about hope in general, any cool conservation stories or success stories on climate improvement that you have seen? Um, nothing 
it really is coming too much to mind um, on a kind of personal community level. Um, a few years ago, actually, when you were visiting, I remember we went oh, to cool. church and yeah. you were like, hey, some of your plants are not native plants. Mm-hmm. You should change that. And I had brought it up to the church and um, gardening has become a major part of our um, church community in our church life. That's awesome. Um, the fact that they have cleaned up the gardens and planted lots of different native plants. We even got out of an Eagle Scout project, we had a community garden built for us. And so now they are build, they are growing vegetables and they give them out at the end of service. And it's, it's incredible. And so that is something that came directly from you pointing it out to me and then me being able to take it to, you know, kind of that next level of what can I do? That's really, oh, that's so cool. That gives me like little warm fuzzies. Um, And I, I think goes back to that connection between the earth and uh, if we are Christians, I know what, what the Bible says about it. Um, I am not very well versed in other world religions, but I do know that there are some similar concepts throughout many of them, the earth and its importance being one of them. And we're called to be stewards of it. And so if I'm supposed to be out here living like Christ, I need to be a steward of it. And I know that there's lots of other reasons why other religions would say, hey, I'm going to care for my planet. But I think it's uh, a cool overlap to see. Yeah. For sure. So, all right. Kind of the last final thoughts for this this episode, as well as this mini series here, is if we are trying to encourage people to take manageable steps, as well as be able to think positively, and not positively as like think happy thoughts and climate change will go away, because that's not that's not true. Um, but Uh, techniques to reduce some of the anxiety revolving around climate change, uh, human caused climate change specifically. Are there any suggestions that you would have or ideas for how people can be thinking about it that can be summarized in like cute little sentence? Hmm. There's a lot of thoughts going through my brain. Um, I think just kind of the, my last thoughts are to, to try to, um, find like-minded people. Um, if, if you're thinking it, somebody else is thinking it. And if you think something needs to be done, other people think it needs to be done. Um, so search out those like-minded people to do some sort of activism in, I mean, it can be river cleanups. It can be planting trees, even if you're, I don't even know if this group exists, but it sounds super fun. And I just made it up in my head. Even if you're just together doing research on a specific topic, you're you're like, you know what, today we're going to talk about bees. And I'm pretty sure that's what book clubs are for. Yeah. But I never thought of it on a like nonfiction level. Like you know what I mean? I There's never na- thought Oh of my gosh. So the nature center I used to work at ran a nature, it was called the nature lovers book club and they only read nonfiction. And but then but I'm, mine's it. like on more of a, on like a specific topic. Okay. I mean, I mean yeah, it could involve, it could yeah. revolve around a book, but not, but even just like, you just want to hang out I, and research. Yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm no pretty sure this. that's what you and I are doing. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's true. <laughs> okay. So get together with your friends and make a podcast. Yeah. And, and start talking about, and start talking about these topics and you just yeah. never know what will come out of it. True. Very true. I had, um, gonna be honest. I had an idea of what this mini series was going to look like. And it came out in, in my head way cooler than what I thought it was going to be. So even if you're like, well, I don't want to make a podcast. Um, 
I mean, still just getting together and hanging out is a good time. And having these conversations, the way that you worded things uh, brought new perspectives into my head or just your own knowledge base and your own where you're coming from with this. Like I learned a lot from you. So it, it's good to two heads are better than one, you know, good to bounce yeah, off of others. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I'm thinking. Um, even if you just find those like-minded people and you start discussing, you never know what you could come up with yeah. together. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love it. Cause I mean, that's what we're doing now. So it's uh, cool to see that sort of peace and action and be like, wow, this to me now is way less scary because I'm literally doing it with you. So <laughs> I could do that with other people too. Exactly. Yeah. So for what it's earth, every person who can I, go and as an introvert, I'm not saying go find a new friend because that sounds ter- that sounds more terrifying than climate change to me. Um, but each person who can go and think about ways that we can be building relationships, because that's kind of what the whole ecosystem is. Everything is interconnected. Everything is building relationships with the plants, with the wildlife, with the land usage. And when we can build relationships, even with one person that we latch on to and say, okay, this is my person now, that's awesome. And we can go out and be making these tangible differences in our communities, in our regions, and eventually in our global community as well. We will be making the earth such a beautiful place that inspires people and encourages them to continue loving and being a steward of the planet. So with that, thank you so much for digging deeper into the natural world with the Art of Ecology and with Sam Ruba. And thank you for joining us for this awesome climate mini series that we did. Um, Sam, anything to plug? No. And you know what? I filled up the series with some good plugs. And uh, I think my plug would just be for you because this has been, (laughs) this has been such an incredible opportunity to get to do this with you. And I think everyone should want to to do something like this. Oh, well, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Plug plug me, the art of ecology. Um, But then I'm going to kind of bounce off of the idea earlier, find a book club that does like nature stuff. And if you don't know of one, create one book clubs are pretty easy to create or to be a part of. If you have any bookstores in your area, they usually have community book clubs where you can be like, Hey, I want to use your store as a venue to host the club, or you can just have people come to your house on a monthly basis and drink and have a good time talking about the book. And you can be choosing some amazing nature themed books out there that mm-hmm. help add to your add to your repertoire of environmental knowledge. You know, you got your podcast here, you got your books there. Consume all sorts of media. It's great. Awesome. But thank you so much for joining us for this climate change mini series. You can stay tuned. The Next part of season three of For What It's Earth will be a much, um, I thought this was going to be a much heavier mini series than I think we made it out to be, which is really exciting. That was the goal. Um, however, my husband and I will be doing a series of choose your own adventure books about natural concepts so we'll see if we can uh help endangered species less or if we just murder them on page 87 who knows but you can stay tuned for that we'll be having a really fun time over at our second half of the season but sam any parting words just uh go out and save the earth that awesome <laughs> <laughs> nice And with that, I will see you for mini series number two of season three on For What It's Earth.